just Garth, Garth nailed it. Um, over here first, Tony. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm kind of interested in the idea of talking about inclusivity when you're talking about indigenous people, queer people, um, with color and everything, and um, trying to include people with disabilities in that. Um, if anything about that came up in BAM, if there's a model for it, I have an invisible disability, and in my disability services community, I approach them about higher education. I'm um, trying to be a PhD candidate here. I have a master's in media arts. And um, they basically said, our people don't go to higher education. And at that time, I was receiving services with another woman who was doing her master's and someone else who was doing their bachelor's degree within this disability services education. And I'm wondering if that came up at all in your conversations in BAM. Any ideas about pedagogy and disability? Well, do you want to take that? Oh. It came up at one instance. It came up when we were talking about new digital communities and the degree to which the digital had enabled mm -hmm. uh, mobility, enabled the, the kind of suturing of new place and time, new community among, among dis disabled people. To be honest with you, that it wasn't a focal consideration, but that was the only instance that I can recall that came up. Can no. you recall? No, I can't. But let me flip it on its head. Uh, first of all, point taken. Okay, it's something that will need to be built into any kind of programmatic way forward. But what I didn't what didn't come up is we didn't use the language of inclusivity. We used the language of diversity. Right. Okay? Very deliberate. Because I, I think that inclusivity is already means tokenism. It's already been appropriated yeah. to mean tokenism for the minorities and the others. When in fact, the place that we want to start is with that species survival argument that right. says right. you're eliminating diversity. You're standardizing the universe. And as John Walensky said, you're dividing the universe and then you're standardizing it, okay? Mm -hmm. so, that we, so we wanted to start with the notion that you're eliminating our very are very grounds for survival. And that case would probably be made. So people quoted uh, Wilson. Um, um, I, I learned the argument through Tony Wilden at SFU through ecosystemic uh, theory. And, and it's in cybernetic systems theory. It's in Gregory Bateson. So we were making the argument that you have to have species diversity, diversity of knowledge, diversity of every kind in order to survive. And that, in fact, the deficit was among monocultures. Okay, that, that people without diversity were actually suffering. Okay, so we were trying to flip it in its head. But, so that's just an a addendum. But in terms of your comment on the, in, <coughs> on the disabled communities, uh, no, but it's something we'll have to work with. Mm -hmm. There's only one university in Canada that has a PhD in disability um, at this moment. Really? Yeah, York. In York. Okay. There are chairs in disability studies, aren't there? In Canada? Um, York's the only university that has a PhD program. I don't know about that. I just want to, uh, to comment that, that in my work uh, with queer seniors and queer youth, uh, we have a model that groups around meaningful challenge, which I guess translates into rich tasks. So the project I'm working on right now at SFU is um, funded by a grant from the Council to Reduce Elder Abuse. So what we have is a group of queer seniors and a group of queer youth who will work together to create digital videos and fact sheets around elder abuse in the queer community. And I was a little thrown by your question because I'm I'm so used to working with with disability in my <coughs> group the seniors, right? MS, bipolar, um, scooters, um, you, you know, I don't even see it anymore. And the way we work with that is the everybody brings everybody else along. The idea of separating out somebody with a disability um, 
it is just very foreign to me now that um, you know we, 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 when you work collaboratively um, that that's the way it happens you know that if somebody can't remember stuff we we think of ways to do that we have somebody with an index card working with somebody who has dementia uh, to, to give them the card and, 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 and put them on the stage. We, we bring each other along. It's, it's foreign to me to think of separating out, you know, able people and disabled people and uh, falling apart across that divide. Does, does that make any sense? You know, the youth will will contribute, the elders will contribute, whatever their level of disability and the task will get done. Um, in a way, um, I, I took a, a class in women's studies about writing from the margins. And um, disability wasn't address. We were talking about Rio Gilberto Menchu. There was all kinds of... Rigoberto Menchu. Yes. And so just having it not really part of a margin, <coughs> it actually made me feel that as a person with disability, I was actually excluded even from the margins. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. So I don't actually, I didn't feel that that gives me an No. Our identifications are important places for which we speak, right? One of the things that I'm hearing from both of you that, that did come up is this, the importance of narrative to stand a story again mm -hmm. in all of these communities. And to me, that's a little bit like eating crow because with New London, we were so strongly pushing down the expository models, having, you know, using the technology of systemic functional linguistics. And to return to our room, when, when I was at SFU, Kieran Egan kept talking about teaching and storytelling. I kept kind of turning up my nose to it. Um, don't tell him, but I think it's a good idea. <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I think now that um, it's, it, I, I'm now seeing a, a real significance of, of the return to narrative and the importance of narrative, particularly given the standardization of writing forms that are going on now in, in school. Okay? And it's all done under the auspices of equity, giving people access to genres of power now. And so, so. Tony and Rio go. Uh, well, I, I was just at a conference on the future of the humanities doctorate, yeah. and many of the same issues that you are addressing were addressed there, although not articulated in the way that you're addressing it. And it occurred to me again and again that the problem that, that made us made people have difficulty imagining something beyond what we currently have, some new new ways of, 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 of uh, progressing, was assessment, and, and in two ways it's assessment. One was you know, the, the kind of state-mandated uh, regimes of, of credentialing and, and, and sifting that schools have been given, on the one hand. On the other hand, the inability of the teachers to, um, to keep up with the kinds of changes in literacy, for example, um, and in the communities represented in the classroom, feeling unable to, to be an assessor of the kinds of things that, 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 that children and, and PhD students were doing. So those two ways in which assessment blocked our imaginations yes. uh, moving forward. And I wonder, you talk about performativity, but what other things were people talking about? in order? Because that's at the heart of the schooling project, isn't it? Right? It's one of the things in the schooling project that unless we can change that or deal with yeah. that, yeah. we're stuck Excellent. with what we've got. We'll yeah. always be stuck with that. So, well, I can think of two examples. First of all, you're right about that. The assessment issue, the accountability issue, is always there as a, as a gatekeeper. Um, when we did uh, rich tasks and productive pedagogies in Queensland schools, we found that, and even the experience of the international baccalaureate people who used rich tasks, is we found that, um, that uh, implementing them in the elementary school, particularly in indigenous and in low SES schools, was a piece of cake. Uh, because partly because they were areas of neglect, but partly because uh, elementary teachers, what they ran into was lack of threshold knowledge in cognate areas, but nonetheless they were game. The middle school was looking, always looking for the reinvention through holistic tasks and performance because of the um, alleged unruliness of adolescence. Alleged, okay? 
as soon as we get to the high school, the secondary school, and high stakes assessment cuts in, and, and articulated trajectories to tertiary education cuts in, things get conventional very quickly, okay? Uh, Jim Ladwig's quote from our productive pedagogies, uh, uh, discipli uh, disciplines are never what they used to be except in high school. Okay. High schools are the last gatekeepers of canonical old style knowledge, okay? They're always the last to change. However, um, I think where I see some change is the university that I um, have retired from, Queensland University of Technology, no longer has an English department, much to the consternation of others. John Hartley and Stuart Cunningham um, created what's called the Department of Creative Industries, which puts together literature, journalism, fashion design, animation, video gaming, performance, drama, and actors, and acting, and music, all together, okay? And um, of course, the, the critical left, people hated this, selling out cultural studies. The art for art's sake community hated it, proletarianizing high art. The English departments and the, uh, all the traditional disciplines hated it. What's a university without an English department? Okay, but nonetheless, what we begin to see is we suddenly begin to see, remember I said Snowden never finished high school? We're beginning to see open admission to QUT on the basis of portfolio and performance in all of those areas. And not only that, we're seeing success, economic success and professional success. I can tell you which movies were done by QUT graduates, which video games and apps were run by QUT graduates, and those are becoming the performative benchmarks for the success of QUT graduates. So we're seeing in some sectors the reinvention of the traditional gatekeeping of the university. And when that changes, the whole game is over. And the irony of it is uh, for the New London, for the, um, for the Banff group, one of the headpieces that Dennis and I dug up is the Australian military is now recruiting um, soldiers um, not from, um, from gamer communities. So they're going directly. Remember I said Snowden was, was just a nerd, okay? So what's happening is industry is actually bypassing the credentialing system as being retrograde where it suits them. Capital plays funny games. So I think gradually what we're going to begin to see is more portfolio entry to university. Okay. And the, we've already had it with my partner is a mature age entry to SFU at age 27, you know? Uh, so we're, we, it's always been there. Okay, you too. Okay, Mike Rose as well. So uh, we could go through Gunter Kress as well. Mature age entry, he was a fitter and turner who entered university in his late, in his late 20s. Okay. So we have all of these alternative pathways that I think are beginning to open up. The best predictor, apparently, for uh, good performance in college is ultimate quiz being done. <laughs> Far better than SAT scores. I think we echo it, didn't we? Yeah, you echo it. Yeah, I think that's very hopeful. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like um, unless we change the um, system, how teachers um, try to come up with new ideas and you know, everything. So um, I'm more, um, I see more need to look at the um, institutional change rather than going for so changes. But anyway, um, I think that the focus on diversity um, is opposed to the, um, you know, the trend for globalization, which um, and uh, uh, promotes uh, homogeneity and you know, standardization and things like that. That's um, also related to uh, neoliberal capitalism and so forth. And that's also related to um, maybe a written educational goal, which is to prepare students <coughs> for, uh, to, to become you know, successful individuals in the, um, capitalism, right? So that's um, you know, educational goal. And um, testing is a way to sort people um, in this system, you know, for you know, people who are successful or not, successful people.
can become leaders, business leaders, and they make more money. And so that's why you know the the, um, the gap between the rich and the poor doesn't go away. And so um, I'm I'm just thinking how can educators and teacher educators and researchers can influence um, these policies and you know, institutional policies, and also more um, broadly. Um, um, well, <laughs> you um, you work with them, and you get burned, and then you get up and you work with them again, and you get burned again. I mean, all of us, when you go into a deanship, you're making those decisions, or a headship. You know, you, you cross your heart and hope to die that you aren't going to, Rob and I, can, you know, we can all talk about this room. You cross your heart and you hope to die, but you, you don't become the enemy. And you just plug away at it, okay? Um, when you go work with ministries of education, you do it. When you become the principal of the school, you do it. So you're always working within these institutions. But what, what I can say is that this model that they're pursuing now has a finite life. I think I, it's, it just is not viable. It just will, it, it is imploded. It's not, it's going to be held and hoisted on its own guitar. It is not going to be, be able to deliver what it purports to deliver, which is um, um, human capital that is able to increase GDP. It's not going to be able to purport to generate increased test scores for the most small clinics. Gaps are not going to be closed under the existing model. Okay? So I, I think that you, we have to be ready with generative models that actually can, be, can move in when these, when these things actually begin to be small. And then generationally, I suspect, I mean, we had our turn. Baby boomers went through 68, did what we had to do, and then there was a point in which government turned to us, okay, in which our friends were prime ministers, or et cetera, or our colleagues of our generation, and some of us had the opportunity to step up and, and engage. Okay? And you do that, and it's unpredictable as to what, what will happen, but you, you take your chance. Okay? But anybody who says to me that these institutions are unassailable, repressively tolerated, and do not change, wasn't in this room in 1978. This institution has changed. Look at what you've done to transgress against the hegemony of IELTS and ESL band scales and so forth. In and around the ESL questions within an institution like this, or in Vancouver City School, or Burnley City School District, okay? So the battle continues. I, I am not, I'm, you know, I'm not hopeless about this at all. Look at the status of the, look at what's happening with truth and reconciliation. Is it compromised? Is it vexed? Yes. But is it important? Yes. Is it a way that you've got to ride? Yes, you've got to ride. Okay? So I think all of those things are there. Yes, I've read Bowles and Gintis. Yes, I know it's a sorting machine. Yes, I know it's social reproduction. Yes, I know it's all of those things. Okay? But, um, you know, we keep punching away at it. Because I think within an gener academic generation, you will begin to see it. And, you, and, and some of you here who are younger and say you're doing your PhDs or that, et cetera, within your time, um, you're going to see, you're going you're to be in those positions, unpredictable. Okay. I, I was just at Beijing Normal. I thought Beijing Normal, I was, you know, where Rob and I both work do some time. I thought Beijing Normal in the new China was all basically, you know, we're in the elite, we're in the best and brightest of one million. You know, these people are really smart, like they blow you away consistently ask you questions about things you've never thought about, et cetera. But the more time that I spent with the students in Beijing Normal, the more of them said to me, okay, it's the new China, yes, it's a hypocritical state, yes, it's a police state, yes, there are problems here, you know what? Um, I'm the first generation of My parents had, and my grandmother had bound feet. Come on, okay, so I, it's a long revolution. Connected this up to the ecopedagogical discussions? We're going to try. Again, maybe that's something that we have to do with people in the room here. But uh, Jim, uh, some other people, Jim, Ludwig, a few other people have worked with those, and we're going to make that connection next. So, yes, absolutely. And Chet Bowers at Oregon was one of the first to connect the critical literacy model to um, ecological models of education. And he did it, he was, he's now retired. He may, he may, uh, but he, he did it about 20 years ago. So I'm going to go back and look at Chet's work. And um, Noel Goff and Annette Goff 
in the trans trans international uh, curriculum community in Australia also have been trying to move for some time. So what I don't want to do with any of this is don't get caught up in the tenured path of the new, in which I'm going to we're going to appropriate this and stick our name on it and say well, BAM for New London is all new. We're always working together, and we've always got to use what's around. And at times, there's stuff that's been dealt with for 20, 30 years, and that won't be. Yeah, it's, uh, particularly at UCLA's uh, Philip Rare Center, uh, yes. there's been a lot of discussion of that, not in terms of physical and environmental issues, but in terms of ethics of caring and relationship uh, issues. Who, Antonia and? Yes, uh, yeah. yeah, and Greg and Lauren. Yeah. Uh, being you, and, and so, um, so the, the, it seems to be a fairly rich discussion that, uh, um, that uh, I, I, many of the issues and the themes that you're suggesting seem to be wrapped up in their discussions right now as well. But at this historic moment, I think what we want to call for is, is new coalitions. Yeah. Because what's happened is that's why we wanted the queer theory and the psychoanalysis in the room with the ecosystemic stuff with with the traditional kind of critical Marxist materialist stuff, because we actually thought it's time, now that we've all split apart and don't talk to each other and, and fought, fought for tenure and fame, you know, it's time for us to get on the same boat again, okay? So I think historically, the moment may be there, okay? Where we've, we've actually got to build a coalition again. Yes? Two things. One, I'd just like to I intrigued that you said no one talks about family I actually do think the neoliberal does talk about family as yes. a production. It's a consumer entity unit within neoliberal terms, I guess. So I think there is a dialogue about what family is and it is intervening on that sort of basis. But building on that, both you and Claire have mentioned a number of times the term community. And community is this space between family and society and it's very amorphous, it's very rubbery. I'm intrigued as to what the conceptualisation of the community was in your conversations and considerations. Not, not yet. Yes. yes. Not yet, but just in terms of multiplicity and overlapping, one of the problems, an epistemic and a definitional problem we have, um, is, which I think that Jan Blomert has begun to address in his notion around scalar literacies, is that we have this amorphous concept that we inherited from Heimsian sociolinguistics of context, which we use in ESL and everything else, of communicative competences in relation to context. Well, what the hell is a context? Okay? Then we go to do case studies, and we teach case study and methodology of qualitative research, and we say you must be explain the context. Well, the context is an arbitrary then we talked about borderlands, crossing, Anzaldúa, all that stuff, crossing borders. Well, what are we? All Treaty of Westphalia is a context, a national border. What is a context? <laughs> then we go to Bourdieu, and we got another problem, which is everything's a social field. Social fields are overlapping. Social fields are multiple. Social fields are now non-synchronous. OK, well, in an Aristotelian sense, if a term describes everything and describes any, nothing, it's theology. It's not a term. <laughs> so what? You can't say it, what is contextual unless you can say what is not a context. You can't say what is a social field unless you can say, and I've read Bourdieu, I've looked through every glossary to see whether he ever defines what a social field is. And I don't know that he does a heck of a good job. Okay? So both in research, in community, etc., it's a question of de de determining boundary. In fact, Peter McLaren's work, which drew on Victor Turner's Forest of Symbols, talks about liminal and queer theory talks about being liminal on the boundaries or thresholds things. We talk about diasporic peoples being seeds thrown outside. Well, what is a boundary? What is a context? So that's no answer. But what I'm going to say is that it's not good enough to say it's all overlapping, etc. And the problem that we had with genre theory and print literacy was that it was always based on a sense of audience and context, which we assumed was finite and able to be defined, even though we could never totally control them. Now suddenly what we have is people writing on blogs or doing their Facebook to totally indeterminate multiple contexts, social fields, and audiences inhabiting communities simultaneously in ways that we can't, and multiple levels of scale, Walmart scale of the receipts, that we can't define. Shit, we're in trouble, unless we get it. Now linguistically, I made a note on this, 
we don't have a model of the consequences of text. We have models of audience, but we don't talk about it. Freebody and I have a model of reading that talks about what is the text trying to do to you, but we don't, with writers, talk about the moral consequences of text like we used to in literary stuff. Rhetoric. You know, rhetoric. rhetoric. Okay, that would be doing it. Twenty-five hundred years. So, look, I've got a last little shopping list here that I want. You asked what are the parameters of what we're doing. Here's what we did come away with, and we did had some agreement on, but they're just areas of these. One is that we had to teach kids something about the new political economy of information. We teach them nothing now. <coughs> How are you going to teach about surveillance, control, Google, etc.? They're exploring it when they read The Gift, when they read Oryx and Craig. They're exploring the questions of information economies and who's, who's, who has the right to speak about what or write about what to whom. They, they're exploring. But we, and we've got all kinds of, okay, so that's one issue. What do we teach them about the new information economies? And I've read through all the multiliteracy handbooks and nobody has an economy. We teach them how to do these things, but we don't teach them that the cloud is owning our lives and about Snowden and about the NSA. Interesting. Second thing we had, communicative ethics. We schools are busy patching in no cyberbullying, no pornography policies on a totally ad hoc basis. And teachers every day and parents every day are saying, you can't do this and I've just put an app on this. But there's no umbrella discussion amongst us, among the educational community, or amongst multiliteracy communities about what's right and wrong. Now Habermas talked about the ideal speech situation and communicative ethics. Austin spoke about the definition between what you intend, what you say, and what its effects are. But we don't really have models of the consequences of text and the moral consequences of text anymore. Interesting. We did in literature, but we don't anymore. So communicative ethics. Next thing we talked about. We talked about um, a per performative models of pedagogy and bringing the body back in. Bringing the body and space back in to displaced people and disembodied people. Because watching a lot of these kids, I mean, the real fear is they lose their bodies and they lose their place. And I can't think, I, talk, I talked about it as being autogenocidal. You want to kill off a bunch of people? Cut them off from their bodies and, and cut them off from their place. And they'll be talking heads. And they'll go to, what did Margaret Atwood call it? They'll go to Mar Martha Graham University or what was the other university? There were two universities that she had. Moved, moved. Okay, and the, the last thing we talked about was seeing diversity not in the inclusive multicultural model to be repressively tolerated, but as necessary. Diversity in every form, textual diversity, knowledge diversity, epistemic diversity, embodied diversity, as necessary for survival. Okay? So those were the themes that came out, all unresolved. And I think you guys have done a good job of picking out the questions and the, the, the unresolved issues that we have Last word to my colleague. Last word. No, that's, that was a great, great summation, Alan. I think we did okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're still talking after two weeks, okay? Yeah. We're still. I want to thank you, first of all, I want to thank you, Claire. That was a beautiful opening memoir, beautifully written, and you always cut to the chase. Um, and Alan, you're always so wonderfully expansive and provocative, and this was just so interesting. And so I just want you all to join me in thanking Alan. Too, that Alan beginning September officially you're going to be an affiliate of LLED so hopefully we'll try to get you back and out of retirement as yeah. much as possible. I'll be back next May, right? Okay. We're talking. Hopefully. Okay. Maybe before that. So anyway, please, we have about 10 more minutes so please eat and keep talking and ask Alan more questions and keep the conversation going. Thank you.